Hi, I'm Bruce Fumi. Have you heard the story of the last Jacobite? Who was he? Where did he live? How did the Hanoverians punish him? And when did he die? Let me take you on a journey of discovery. If you're interested in the people, places and events in Scottish history, then hit the subscribe button at the bottom right hand side at any time during this video. Oh, and click the notification bell to make sure that they tell you when I bring out new videos. In the meantime, let me take you on a drive. The Jacobite cause started in 1688. Now if you're in any doubt, then watch my video, The Jacobite Rebellion, or was it? But of the many Jacobite uprisings, the two that are remembered most are the 1715 and the 1745. And today, I'm gonna to take you to where they started and finished as we go on a road trip to Braemar. I also want to tell you about a guy called Peter Grant. Now straight away the football fans are going to think of a guy that played midfield for Celtic in the 80s and the Rockers are going to think of the manager of Led Zeppelin. Given that my subscribers are largely rock and roll football fans who like a bit of history, I'm going to focus on the name by which our Peter Grant came to be known. Like many Highlanders, he was known by his address, his home, the name of his croft, Dubrach. Now the Jacobite rising of 1715 started on the 6th of September when John Erskine, Earl of Mar, came back from London to his home, the Earldom of Mar, to raise the standard for the rightful king. So that's why we're going to Braemar. Now, by the way, a huge thanks to Liam McNamara for the drone shots. Brilliant, eh? Now, the Croft of Dubrich was on the Braes of Mar. So it might be natural for Dubrich to leave Dubrich and join up with Mar's Jacobite cause. But he didn't. Because he wasn't yet Dubrich. He was only one at the time. The recently crowned George I of Hanover might have thought that he'd dealt with the Jacobite threat when it collapsed in Preston and fizzled out in Sheriff Muir on the 13th of November 1715. But Jacobite sentiment remained in these hills and glens as Dubrich grew to manhood. Of course, Dubrich grew into a big, ginger, hairy, illustrious, claymore-wielding Highland warrior. Well, nearly. He actually apprenticed as a tailor. So by the time he was 31 and Bonnie Prince Charlie landed in the West Highlands, Dubrich was in Aberdeenshire, stitching away. But one night, he put down his needle and the next morning, he took up a broadsword. Now how will a tailor fare in the face of cannon fire? Well, they say he got through it pretty well and many a redcoat faced the ferocity of a Highland charge then a claymore measuring his inside leg. Ooh. The first proper battle was just south of Edinburgh at Preston Pans. And our tailor showed such bravery that he was promoted to Sergeant Major. And that bravery continued right through to Culloden. He's reputed to have demanded that they put away their guns and just get into the redcoats with their swords. Sounds like a Ouija to me. But however unusual, Dubrick has sounded up until now, he was more unusual still. Because he wasn't killed at Culloden, but he didn't escape. They say that he killed 12 men before he was captured. Now, stories grow arms and legs, like similes grow wearisome. What we can say for sure is that he was captured and taken to Carlisle, to where a Hanoverian courtroom was waiting for him. Once visited Carlisle Castle, and the guide gleefully showed me a dimple in the stone wall of one of the dungeons, which she said had been eroded by the tongues of Jacobite Scots licking the wall in a desperate attempt to quench their thirst with any drip of water they could get. Ah, you'll not be wanting a tip then, eh? It's certainly true that horrific conditions meant that some would die before facing the likelihood of deportation and servitude, or a quicker but more gory traitor's death. And Dubrich, no ordinary character. Somehow, he managed to get over the wall 
escape the castle, avoid capture, cross the border and travel through hostile Hanoverian Galloway all the way north to arrive back home here in the Brazer Mar. The problem was that the Redcoats had occupied the staunchly Jacobite area and were barracked at Braemar Castle. How many nights did Dubrich have to spend out in the cold hills? How many days hidden in the heather waiting for sustenance from some friend or kin? Or a Redcoat bayonet, an outlaw's capture and a traitor's death? Like his prince, he survived and avoided Redcoat capture in spite of the price in his head. The general amnesty granted after Culloden wasn't until 1747. But eventually Dubrich settled back into the life of a tailor and a crofter. He had six children with a wife 32 years his junior, and yet she still predeceased him at the age of 65. That was 1811 when Napoleon provided a new bogeyman for Hanoverian Britain. They'd forgotten about old Dubrich, but this time he was living with one of his bairns in Angus. Now in our modern days of roads, that seems like a long way away from here, but in truth, the Angus Glens are a walk over the hills behind me. And it was two walkers in those hills who came across him in his senior years, and they were astonished by the sprightliness of old Dubrich and the fact that he was even alive at his age, hale and hearty. He regaled them with stories of Culloden in the 45 and he showed them how to use a broadsword. Now at the end, I'll leave a link to regale you with more of my Jacobite stories, so be sure to watch some. But Bonnie Prince Charlie was long dead by now. Cameron of Lochiel and Lord George Murray were gone. He'd outlived George II, who they'd all fought against. He'd outlived that king's son, Frederick. He'd even outlived his grandson, George III, and seen him lose the American colonies, all from this Highland Glen. None of them had come to Scotland. But it had been decided that George IV would visit Edinburgh in 1822. The Jacobite threat was over. Oh. So Sir Walter Scott had Lowlanders, English and German royals all dress up in Highland garb. Even some of the cowed clans turned out for the pageant, or pantomime as I should say. Now as it happens, one of Dubrich's well-to-do walking gents was friendly with the Honourable William Mole later Lord Panmure, and he petitioned George IV to provide a pension for his oldest enemy. And somebody thought that it would be a great idea and a demonstration of the newfound unity of George and Britain if the last surviving Jacobite was presented to George IV on his visit to Edinburgh. Now the story goes that old Dubrich was taken down from his glen and a new suit of clothes was made for him so he could sit for a portrait and then be presented to King George in his Edinburgh visit. A bit like when the Queen meets the plebs here at the Braemar gathering today. Now being a tailor to trade, old Dubrich would have known the value of a suit of clothes and he gratefully accepted them. But he refused to wear them for the big meeting. They say that he turned up to meet George IV in the same clothes that he'd worn on the 16th of April 1745 when he stood against the man's great-grandfather on Dromossi Moor. When asked to take off his hat, old Dubrick politely declined. And covering the embarrassment, the king supposedly said, Oh, Grant, you're my oldest friend. To which Dubrick replied, Na na, your majesty, I'm your oldest enemy. It was all laughed off as good sport, misunderstanding and a confusion of accents. And old Dubrich headed off the unreformed last Jacobite with a pension of 52 guineas a year. At 108, he didn't have that long to enjoy it, but he did enjoy sprightly good health right up until he died two years later at the ripe old age of 110. They say 
300 came from all around and four gallons of whiskey was drunk to see him off. His youthful 81-year-old pal Charles Lamont was one of the three pipers that led the coffin playing wall fight for Charlie's right. And he was laid down to rest here in the cemetery next door to Braemar Castle which had housed his red coat hunters all those years ago. I dare say he'd outlived them all and there was no one coming to hunt him now. There'll be a link for you to see a playlist of Jacobite stories in a second but first I should say that portrait old Dubrick sat for now hangs in the National Portrait Gallery in Edinburgh with the great and the good. And here Engraved in this slab, it says, The old loyal Jacobite is at peace. He kept faith with his rightful monarchs all of his life, a hero and a man of honour to the last. If you're passing Braemar Castle, why not stop in at the Kirkyard and pay your respects to old Dubrich, the last Jacobite? Hamindoch is going to be a lamb alive. Cheerio, Andrasta.